Hello everyone, I'm Anthony Bergeron, and this is Bergeron the Movies, where I talk about my favorite movies of all time and why I love them so much. However, in order to discuss these movies in depth, I'm going to have to include some spoilers, so don't watch this until you've seen the movie. If you like these videos, please subscribe to my YouTube channel and hit the bell so you get notified every time I post a new video. You can also find me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Today I'm filming from my comfy and new and improved movie loft in my room, and it's quite, quite cozy if I do say so myself. With all that out of the way, let's get started with this week's video where I talk about one of the greatest slashers of all time, the 1983 horror classic, Sleepaway Camp. summertime, a time for fun, sunbathing, camping, parties, and did someone say murder? murder? <laughs> yes, campground cabin slasher movies have become the single most overused horror setting trope you can think of, and the trend refuses to die, even in movies that uh, come out now that think they're being very meta about it, like Cabin in the Woods, which, mind you, I thought Cabin in the Woods was okay. I didn't love it, I was surprised that it got the hype that it did, but they keep making movies about cabins in the woods. And bonus points if you make them hillbilly zombies, how many times am I going to see hillbillies killing people in the woods? I mean, really. But before it was a trope, it was actually scary. The movie that really started it all was the original 1980 classic, Friday the 13th. When you think of camp slashers, you usually do think of Friday the 13th first, as you should. But personally, if someone were to say they haven't seen Friday the 13th or Sleepaway Camp, I would recommend Sleepaway Camp immediately. Although the director, Robert Hiltzik, said that he had the idea long before Friday the 13th he wanted to make a camp slasher movie, uh, it was still the thing at the time. Um, you know, it was still new and very successful because Friday the 13th was such a hit. I personally don't really care for the Friday the 13th franchise. Actually, that's not true. It's not that I don't like Friday the 13th and what it has done for the genre. It's just I don't like what they did with Jason. I don't like what happened with Jason. But I'm here to talk about Sleepaway Camp. So Sleepaway Camp came out in 1983 and begins with a father and his two kids enjoying a sunny day in a boat on a lake. The kids are bickering and the dad says it's time to head back to the shore but they accidentally tip the boat over and end up in the water. There are also some irresponsible kids water skiing in a speedboat nearby. They end up losing control of the boat, which unfortunately crashes right into the family, killing the father and one of the kids. That girl is giving it her all in this scene. You know that she was like, this is my moment. I gotta kill it right now. Jump to a few years later and we meet Angela, the surviving child from the accident, and she is now living with her Aunt Martha and her cousin Ricky. The woman playing Aunt Martha also is giving quite the performance. The performance is so over the top. Uh, it's way too much in my opinion, but I'm sure she was directed to be that crazy, um, as we will find out. Oh, no, no, I'm afraid that they wouldn't approve of that at all even though they know that I am a doctor. So she sends them off to sleepaway camp, which is like summer camp, and it's called Camp Airwack. Oh, I just spilled my popcorn. So Ricky and Angela show up at camp and meet up with all their friends uh, that they haven't seen in a while. We can see that Ricky is actually really protective over Angela, uh, which is important to note, and Angela's still very traumatized over what happened in her youth. We can see that she's very shy, she's very much of a loner, which is very much a contrast to Judy, the popular girl at camp. She doesn't seem to like Angela either, and it isn't long before she ends up bullying her and making fun of her. Looks like we got a real winner here. I'm even kidding. The camp counselors and camp staff are also introduced, and there's this one character of the cook that is completely messed up. His first lines are literally about how he likes little kids. I'm not even going to play the clip of what he says because it's just wrong. And the writing in this movie is honestly just horrible. The lines, the things they say are so bad. I, I get that the character is supposed to be unlikable, but the movie really pushes the envelope when he actually tries to attack and apparently rape Angela in the back room of the kitchen. Luckily, Ricky catches him and saves her just in time. But it is a horror movie, and he is the first on the chopping block. So it isn't long before the first murder happens, and you guessed it, the cook is victim number one. While he is checking his giant pot of corn, someone sneaks up behind him and gives him a shove, knocking him off balance. He grabs the shelf, but the person below grabs the stool he's on and pulls it out from underneath his feet. Ah! Ah! 
He deserved it, though. So the ambulance shows up and wheels him away. And the camp director, uh, Mel, or I don't know what he is. He looks like Hugh Hefner. He says to the staff, don't say anything about this because we don't want to scare the kids and we don't want to ruin the summer experience or get a bad rap. Everybody agrees to keep it quiet for now. The other Cook character is uh, James Earl Jones' dad. A little side note. Uh, Robert Earl Jones, is that his name? Cut back to the boys' cabin and they're horsing around being boys. They end up playing a game of baseball and it's a scene that goes on way too long. I don't know if it's supposed to be plot development. Maybe it is because it ends up with um, Ricky's team winning and uh, the other team swearing to get revenge on Ricky. So it does kind of add to uh, the mystery a bit as to who could be maybe the killer. Then we cut to that evening and campers are mingling in what seems, it looks like a gym or a communal cabin of some sort, and the same bully guys uh, decide to start picking on Angela, who is just minding her own business. But of course, Ricky shows up and steps in to defend her, which causes a huge fight, and Ricky's friend Paul likes Angela, so he tries to comfort her and uh, be nice. So it seems like they are hitting it off, which Judy notices. Out on the lake, one of the kids that was just bullying Angela is now in a boat with a girl camper named Leslie. He starts rocking the boat, and the boat, of course, tips over. Leslie gets really mad and swims away. This kid then, for some reason, goes under the boat, where he quickly realizes he isn't alone. What the hell are you doing here? I bet the rest of the boys will be interested in seeing you. <laughs> The next morning, his body is found by a counselor. Okay, that's scary. That is some good practical effects right there. Mm -hmm. Cut to the girls who are playing volleyball, and Angela is not. But Paul shows up again, and you can see that Angela is actually starting to really warm up to him. And um, she's actually smiling for once. He asks her if she wants to have some sort of date later that night, and Judy notices. How come Angela gets to talk to the boys all day, and we have to play volleyball? So Meg, Judy's friend, goes over and bullies Angela before a camp counselor breaks it up again. That night, after some camp event, the kids all wander off, and Paul tries to kiss Angela uh, when they get a moment alone, and she gets really weird and uncomfortable and leaves him alone. The next morning, the girls are in their cabin getting ready, and Judy decides it's time to pick on Angela again. Hey, Angela, how come you never take showers when the rest of us do? You queer or something? Angela's like, screw this, I get getting bullied. So she leaves the cabin and she is quickly met with the boys who throw a water balloon at her head. Ricky flies off the handle and starts giving us some more brilliant writing. Dang, Ricky. Paul shows up again and tries to comfort Angela. Oh, he's such a sweetheart. So the camp director, I keep calling him Hugh Hefner though, Mel breaks up the fight and um, the main jock bully goes back to the boys' cabin to use the restroom. Now take a wild guess what's about to happen to this guy. Take a wild guess. Okay. You did not guess it was going to be a beehive, but he got the beehive. He got the beehive. So cut back to Hugh Hefner, who is now suspecting Ricky is the one doing all the killing around the camp. Meanwhile, Angela has wandered outside her cabin and, uh-oh. Oh! oh! <laughs> it's just Paul again. <laughs> Paul. Anyway, Paul's like, let's go to the lake. So they go to the lake and they start making out. But then Angela is like, no, don't. Come on, Angela. I'm not doing anything. And for some reason, this starts to give Angela flashbacks of something that happened in her childhood where she saw her dad with another man. This is the same man, actually, that was on the shore at the beginning of the movie. So this is clearly uh, her father's gay lover. But there's something about this flashback that is kind of vague and you can't quite make sense of it. The first time you watch the movie, I mean. The next day, Angela and Ricky are walking through the woods and they run into Judy and Paul, who are making out. But it's clear that Judy kind of provoked it, even though Paul should have known better. So Angela runs off sad, of course, and Paul chases her. Uh, Ricky, uh, Ricky's obviously upset at Judy, too, because he liked her and uh, for some reason, and uh, she keeps rejecting him. So everyone kind of has a reason to be angry now. Later, Paul tries to apologize to Angela, but she's just back to being weird and isolated and shy again. So, oh, Jesus, Judy, go away! Especially after he told me what a prude you are. That isn't 
is the word you used. Isn't it, Paul? I gotta go. <laughs> okay, I don't want to sound like a horrible person, but if I was the killer, I would totally kill Judy next. So she scares off Paul. Oh, thanks, Paul, for sticking around. And before you know it, Meg and Judy are dragging Angela to force her in the water because she doesn't like to get in the water. They're complete psychopaths, okay? Ricky tries to save her again, but the camp director, Hugh Hefner, has pulled him aside to start questioning him about everything that's been going on. And unfortunately... Angela! If you aren't the killer, you gotta get killed next because you're annoying. Oh. Oh! Okay, good. Okay, good. See, I was just saying, someone's gotta kill Judy. She's a bitch. Oh, it's you. What do you want? Well... Whoa! Whoa! Whoa, I will say... Whoa! I will say the curling iron was a bit much. This movie's ballsy, huh? Wow. Meanwhile, Meg, the other bitch, has been flirting with Hugh Hefner the whole time uh, they've been at camp. And because this movie can't seem to get awkward enough, he agrees to meet up with her later that night. The things they do in this movie, it's like, really? So she goes to take a shower to get ready for their hot date, and you will never guess what happens to her. Well, Hugh Hefner shows up and is pissed. Not only is he pissed about the murders, but now that he's not going to be able to commit statutory rape, he's really mad. This is the final straw. Hugh, overdramatic and unrealistic monologue. Stop Gotta stop him! Won't get away back. Never get away from me again. So Hugh is off to find Ricky, and when he does, he beats the crap out of him before running off and bumping into someone else. It can't be you. It can't be. Attack me! Oh, that's a good kill. So suspense and tension are building as the camp counselors, uh, oh, actually another camp counselor stumbles across a pile of dead bodies in sleeping bags uh, in the woods. So there's this big pile of dead bodies and they're actually supposed to be the little kids. So the body count is growing. Uh, side note, that's the one thing the director says he kind of regrets. Um, he wishes he didn't kill all those little kids, but I digress. We check back with Paul and Angela, who are by the lake again, and this time Angela asks him to take off his clothes, which of course Paul happily and quickly does. Angela turns and we see that she's starting to disrobe as well. The other camp counselors find Ricky beaten and barely conscious. Now knowing that there's an active killer roaming the grounds, uh, the remaining few try to find Angela, Paul, and anyone else that they can. And sure enough, they do find Angela and Paul by the lake. However... Oh, did I miss something? Oh, right. You were watching Sleepaway Camp, and you ended up, you ended up, you got Crying Game. This was me watching Sleepaway Camp for the first time. Actually, Crying Game came out after this, so Sleepaway Camp was way ahead of its time. But this is, I mean, you did not see that ending coming. Let's be real. You might have suspected Angela was the killer, but you did not think she was a boy, did ya? So the little boy at the beginning of the movie is actually the one who survived the boating accident. And the crazy Aunt Martha decided since she already had a little boy with Ricky that she wanted a daughter when she adopted her. Is it worth it to see the look on anyone's face when they get to that ending? Yes. You bet it is. Not to mention Angela's scary ass face. Good luck getting that iconic image out of your head. But that's it. That is the end of Sleepaway Camp. And as you can see, it is a one of a kind slasher movie. I would say it's one of the best bad movies of all time. So I hope you have seen it if you're watching this video and I hope I did not ruin the movie for you because it really is one of the best endings in horror history and you can ask a lot of people about this movie that have seen it and they will um they will agree with you that um the ending the twist is one of the best in all of horror history and um it kind of says forcing gender roles on people can uh, cause some serious psychological damage 
It's a great movie night movie as well because the writing is so bad you'll be laughing the whole time and uh, the ending will have everyone talking as they leave for the night. So if you haven't seen Sleepaway Camp, it is a shame you watch this video, but I hope if you do watch it after seeing this that um, you go in with more appreciation. They did make uh, sequels to this, sequels parts two and three. I think there might even be a four. They, those really are not as iconic. They're fun if you like uh, horror comedies because they really amp up the comedy in Angela, who is not played by the original Angela, um, Felissa Rose. Um, they really just have her talking and giving these crazy one-liners and it's really just her killing a whole bunch of kids. And it's fun, but it in no way really compares to the original, which is a masterpiece. Join me next week for an all-new video. Until then!